Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Marissa Feller from Verona, Wisconsin, and I'm a senior studying sociology and history in the UW-Madison College of Letters and Science. I'm pleased to introduce Simone Munson, who is Collections Development Coordinator at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Today, Simone will be talking about William Hamilton, son of our famous founding father, Alexander Hamilton. William was a territorial lead miner and legislator and a bit of a black sheep in the Hamilton family. Hear about his ties to Wisconsin and his mother, Eliza's trip to visit her pioneering son in this new part of the country. Simone works in the Archives and Museum Collections Division, where she supervises the acquisi acquisitions of archival collections. She provides bibliographic instruction to classes using unpublished records and speaks to other groups about researching a wide variety of historical topics. She also speaks on Wisconsin's role in the women's suffrage movement. Please welcome Simone Munson. Hi, Marissa. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so I uh, have had the opportunity to do a little bit of study on, on William Hamilton, and I wanted to share with everybody today um, some of my experiences. Um, so first, I'm going to ask that everyone try to remember back to 2019, um, before COVID, before the stress of the election, before everyone knew what the inside of your home office looked like. Um, and uh, we might all recall that last spring, that 2019 spring, um, Hamilton came to Wisconsin, Hamilton the Musical came to Wisconsin, um, and it did tour around the state. There were performances in, in Madison and in Appleton and in some other cities around, around the state. Um, and it was during that time that I was asked to be part of a team that would um, to help put the Hamilton Musical into a historical context using collections from the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, the Wisconsin Historical Society is a pretty unique institution. Uh, we have the benefit of not just collecting Wisconsin history, but also collecting North American history. And we have been collecting North American history since the 1840s. Um, and so um, we have a very large collection of materials, including a lot of materials related to the founding of our country, a lot of the, um, the pamphlets and documents and newspapers that are mentioned in Hamilton the Musical, we have copies of in, in our collection. So when the musical was beginning to tour um, and was coming to Wisconsin, we put together um, some materials related to the history of our country that are directly um, relevant to the musical. And way back in 2012, I was contacted by a researcher who was working on a biography of William Hamilton. She was particularly interested in his time in Illinois, um, but she knew that he had spent a lot of time in Wisconsin and needed to consult the archival collections at the Historical Society to do her research. Um, and so we worked together to help her figure out which materials she needed to look at so that she could work on this biography. And one of the things that she was particularly interested in was finding a photograph or a painting or an image, a likeness of some kind of William. And so my story and my first interaction with William Hamilton is very much centered around um, the photograph that was used for the promotional materials of this and is at the beginning of, of my PowerPoint here. Um, so before we get too far into that story, what I want to do is I want to go through a brief biography of William's life so that you can understand why uh, he has a connection to Wisconsin, um, how he sort of fits into the story of Hamilton's life, Alexander Hamilton's life, um, and why it would be that Eliza Hamilton would end up coming to visit Wisconsin. So um, the very first part of Hamilton's life, his young life, is um, is is probably the part that people are most familiar with if you've seen the musical or if you know the story of the musical, um, because it's in Ham William Hamilton's very young life that um, his father is still living um, and he's growing up in New York. He's born in 1897 um, and he would have lived at the Hamilton Grange, which is what this picture is here. 
Um, and for those of you that are familiar with the story of, of Hamilton, um, you, you know that um, Hamilton's oldest son, Philip, dies and, in 1801. And at that time, William is just four years old. Um, he's six years old when his father dies a few years later. And he's 10 years old when his mother helps open the first public orphanage in New York. Um, and so we can see here that his, his young age, his young childhood is very, very much influenced by these very um, significant, sometimes traumatic events. And we can try to picture a, a boy growing up between the ages of, of four and, and 10 or 12 experiencing a lot of grief, a lot of mourning, a lot of, of changes that are happening in his life. He would have had to move. Um, his family experienced a lot of debt and there was um, some fin financial um, insecurity that the family went through. Um, and he would, he would have been experiencing all these, all these changes as, as a pretty young boy. Um, and so we can imagine that that is, is sort of his, his childhood experience, definitely a childhood that included a significant amount of education. Um, we know that he knew Latin and French um, and he would have had um, a lot of, of opportunities that were available to him. Um, in 1914, he attends West Point um, and he is, that's at age 17 and he attends the military academy until early 1817 when he resigns from the school pretty abruptly. Um, the documentation related to his time at West Point is not very significant. But we do know that he um, goes on vacation in 1817 and he just never returns to the school. Um, and so we start to see this maybe idea of a little bit of a wanderer, um, someone who, who um, is maybe not very happy um, in, in his current situation. Um, we do know that he, he read the law, but he rarely practiced at the bar. Um, and so education played a very, very important role in his childhood and for um, and in and, and his growing up, which is pretty consistent with what you'd imagine a son of Alexander Hamilton to be. Um, I should say that, you know, he is the sixth of eight children. So I said he was born in 1797. Um, before him, we have um, Philip, the one who, who dies in, in a duel in 1801. Um, Angelica, Alexander Jr., James, John, then William, then Eliza. And then the last child born, his name is also Philip. He's known as Philip II or Philip the Younger. Um, and he's born in 1802, shortly after the death of his oldest brother. Um, and um, as we get further along in this story, um, the birth and death dates of Philip and the younger Philip kind of come back into this story a little bit. So, um, so that, that's, for all intents and purposes, the, the events of the musical um, are finished really before most of William's story really begins. Um, and, and in the musical itself, we don't necessarily see mention of, of many of the other children um, other, than, other than Philip, who is, who is a character in, in, the, in the musical. So after he, um, his young childhood and after he leaves West Point, he comes, uh, he comes west to Wisconsin. Um, but first he actually spends about 10 years in, um, in Illinois. Um, he turns up in Illinois um, around 1825. Um, and at that time, he, uh, through a family connection, he is able to make connections with the land surveyor's office. So if we think about what is happening in the Western United States at this time, this is all very uncharted territory. Um, the, the government is trying to survey land so that it can, it can make land available, so that it can sell land, um, so that um, it can develop the land that as we move west. Um, and part of that administration involves land surveyors figuring out what is out there, what land is good for farming, what land is good for, um, what natural resources are available, how are we going to use the land that is available to the government. Um, and so 
Um, he turns up in, in Illinois um, in the 1820s and he works as a land surveyor. This would have been very, very isolating work. He would have been out in the field, um, surveying land, documenting sort of um, uncharted land, um, doing a lot of what we would consider camping or living in tents um, and trying to, to figure out um, what uses the land has. Um, we know that he's responsible for the surveying of Peoria, Illinois. And when they surveyed Peoria and made the plan for the city, he is given credit as the um, surveyor who named the streets in Peoria, um, many of which were named after our founding fathers, including his father. Um, and um, he, he also um, is twice elected to the state legislature in Illinois, um, serving short terms. Um, and in 1825, when the Marquis de Lafayette visits the West, um, he comes to Illinois and William Hamilton is said to have been part of the reception party that would have greeted him when he visited Illinois. Um, and there are um, small mentions in, in newspapers that talk about how um, William being the son of Alexander Hamilton would have, it would have been, you know, reuniting with a family friend that um, because the Marquis de Lafayette had such a, a, a strong friendship with um, Hamilton, um, that, that it would have been um, sort of a, a reuniting in some ways. Um, and so um, there's some documentation about, about his involvement in, in that. Um, and we also know that he did practice law a little bit in, in Illinois. Um, he is said to have defended um, a Potawatomi man named Nomukwe, um, who was one of the first people put on trial for, for murder in the state of Illinois. Um, and he successfully defended um, this Native American man against these murder charges. Um, and so the, the stories that we hear about what William's life is like in Illinois are very piecemeal. Um, and this is not surprising and definitely is to be expected of the time period. If we think about the late 1820s and 1830s in Illinois and Wisconsin Territory, um, the, the, the amount of information, the number of people that are in um, this part of the country is, is relatively small. Um, in 1840, there's a territorial census. And at that time in Wisconsin Territory, there's only 30,945 people that are registered on the census. So, this really large um, swath of land that is even larger than what our state is today has, has a very, very small population. Um, and so you can imagine that um, men who are educated, men that have experience in government or perceived experience in government would have been called upon to serve a number of different roles. And we definitely see that throughout William's time in the West. Um, so one of the other sort of um, snippets and stories that comes from um, Hamilton's life is in 1823, um, he is, um, he takes a government contract to drive a herd of cattle up to Fort Howard near Green Bay. Um, and this story almost reads like a folk tale where um, William sort of takes command of a hundred cattle um, and he has to drive them from uh, Sangamon County in Illinois up through Fort Dearborn and then on to Fort Howard in Green Bay. Um, and this is to, to fulfill a government contract and, and to, to make some money along the way. Um, and the story is that, you know, he is sort of doing this on his own um, and it's sort of not easy terrain. He's not familiar with the countryside. The weather isn't working in his favor, but he miraculously makes it to Fort Howard um, I think the story is that he only lost one cow along the way. Um, and so um, you can kind of see how this story reads like a, a little bit of a folk tale. And I think that that's a pretty common kind of um, storytelling technique. And, and part of what we know about the history of this time is so based on these little uh, snippets of information that, um, that would have been available in newspapers or through an oral tradition or documented in small ways. Um, and so um, that is, is kind of our first um, understanding of, of William's activities in Illinois. Um, in um, 
the late 1820s around 1827 is when we first see that he comes to Wisconsin. Um, he comes to Wisconsin um, through these activities of surveying. Um, he had made it as far north in Illinois surveying near Galena um, and had first come in contact with um, lead mining during that time. Um, and it's at this point that he um, buys a thousand acres in Lafayette County um, and he begins to set up and practice uh, lead mining on his own. Um, and so um, he, at, when he first starts lead mining in the late 1820s, he has to figure out a way to not only extract the lead, but he has to get the lead to Galena, which is about a 50, 50 miles away from um, from where he is living. Um, and, and there's a lot of labor and work involved. And so uh, a lot of what we see of William in the 20 years that he spends in Wisconsin is him um, actively helping to build the infrastructure of Southern Wisconsin to make lead mining more profitable, to bring people to the area, um, to make it so that he can um, make his mind profitable without having to travel as far. Um, and so we see that he um, eventually um, does things like um, builds a furnace near Muscaday um, to help with the smelting process. Um, he's interested in trying to establish towns um, in Wisconsin to sort of bring labor to the area and, and make the processing of lead easier. So he's involved with a number of, of um, sort of land speculators in Southern Wisconsin um, and tries to establish communities, um, some of which are still around today, like Wyota. Um, and for a while, his own dwelling is um, given the title of, of Hamilton's Diggings and there's a small community that's built up around um, his, his house in particular. Um, we also see much like his time in Illinois that he is, um, he's, he's spending time um, uh, in government as well. So he does serve um, two terms on um, the, the territorial legislature in 1836 and 1843. Um, and there's some people who speculate that he wanted to have a career in government, that he wanted to take on some of the roles um, that his father took within um, the state government. Um, but it turns out that he's not the most successful politician. Uh, his, his political leanings, uh, he was a Whig uh, politically, and, um, and that made him not very popular within the state. Um, he, uh, he, um, when uh, President Harrison dies, there was some speculation that if, if President Harrison had lived, that maybe William Hamilton would have become the territorial governor or would have had a more successful political career within the territory. But President Tyler um, appoints Henry Dodge to be territorial governor. Um, and once this happens, it's pretty clear that Hamilton's political career within Wisconsin is, is not going to be successful. Um, there's a few uh, descriptions. I think a lot of the descriptions of William are, are interesting because um, they're, because he's the son of Alexander Hamilton, I very rarely read a description of him that didn't mention his father. Um, and I think that because Alexander Hamilton is such a well-known figure, there was always this expectation that William would be something like his father. Um, and so we see this come through in a lot of the descriptions that are, are provided of William. Um, so in one description, we see that uh, he's described as this. Uh, Hamilton was a gentleman of much natural ability, but of eccentric habit. He never married and though naturally of social and genial disposition, he shunned all society. He adapted great plainness of garb and while working in his mines, lived and dressed more coarsely than any of his workmen with his coarse clothes, slouched hat, bare feet and pantaloons rolled up to his knees and covered with mud and dirt. He would hardly have been recognized as the son of the greatest American statesman and one of the most polished gentlemen of any period or country. Um, another description um, talks about how he was a rough and ready miner 
but a very cultured gentleman because he could speak French. Um, and in his cabin, he had shelves filled with books. Among them was a Paris edition of Voltaire. Um, but he lived humbly. His furniture was a rude bed stand with some blankets and buffalo robes for bedding, an oak table, and wood stools. Um, and again, sort of just talking about um, his, his rough um, appearance. And this, these descriptions of William are pretty consistent. Um, they often talk about how he sort of shuns society, how he wasn't very social. Um, you definitely get the impression that he preferred to be alone. Um, and I think compared to his siblings, um, this is one of the things that sort of sets him apart. Um, he's, you know, one, the only sibling really to travel this far west. Um, he's one of the few that doesn't, he doesn't really practice law. Um, he makes his career mostly as a lead miner and we see his involvement in the law to be, to be very minimal. Um, he does, in, in addition to um, taking up a seat in the territorial government briefly, he also is involved in the Black Hawk War. Um, he's called upon to organize the militia for surrounding counties. And during um, the war, his home is fortified and becomes Fort Hamilton. And the picture that is included um, on that slide that was shown is what his home looked like during that fortification. Um, this um, image was done actually in 1923, much later. Um, and some people have said that it's not very accurate, but it does sort of portray what um, these basic fortifications would have been like in Wisconsin during the Black Hawk War period. Um, we know that after the war was over, he does remove the fortifications from his home. Um, um, but during that time where it was fortified for the war, um, he, it is known as Fort Hamilton in Wisconsin. So, um, so now that we have sort of so Williams is in Wisconsin for 20 years. He, he basically is in Wisconsin from um, 1827 up till, um, the, till the 1840s, 1849. Um, and during that time, he is running his lead mine. And it's during that time that his mother, Eliza, decides that she wants to visit the West. She wants to go on a grand tour of the West and see what there is to see and like any good mother visit her son and, and see what he is up to um, out in, in the territory. Um, so in 1837, um, Eliza Hamilton does make um, a trip west. Um, at this point, she's already um, very elderly. She's in her 80s. Um, the portrait that I have um, included here is of Eliza, but this was painted actually after her trip to Wisconsin when she officially retires from her work at the orphanage. So this would have been painted in her early 90s. Um, she travels to the territory, um, and this travel does take some time. To get from New York to Galena, it took just over a week, um, and she uses a combination of different methods of travel. Um, she travels partway over by land and partway by water and then by land again, um, using steamships and rivers that would have been available um, for, for traversing. We also know that she stayed in the area from June until September. And while visiting her son was one of the things that she really wanted to do, it wasn't the only thing that she wanted to do. So she went on multiple excursions during her time um, in Galena, um, where she was staying comfortably um, with other um, well-known family, family friends. Um, and she was able to, to make excursions into other spaces. Um, we know that she traveled north um, on the river. She wanted to see the falls at St. Anthony. Um, and there is a documentation of a reception that was held for her at Fort Snelling, um, where the soldiers at Fort Snelling were um, sort of, um, there was a small sort of military gathering and a reception that was done for her. So she was sort of greeted by all the men that were stationed there. Um, so having a woman like Eliza Hamilton um, who would have been very well known and her husband would have been very well remembered um, was a very, very big deal um, for her to come this far west um, to, to sort of visit the state. Um, and uh, there was an article that was written by the Wisconsin Magazine of History in 1930 
that documents some of the places that she stayed and the types of accommodations that would have been made available to her. Um, and in that article, it becomes very clear that the accommodations that William had to offer weren't up to the standards that she was used to living. Um, and so it sort of leads to the idea that, um, you know, what would their reception have been like after not seeing her son for quite some time? Um, what would the two of, how would the two of them greeted each other? What would her reaction have been to sort of his rough lifestyle? Um, unfortunately, we don't have any documentation of that visit, um, but we can sort of imagine that um, that living out west and in sort of this log cabin in a very rough accommodation was not really what she had imagined for her son. And part of the reason why we know that is because um, of a gift that we know Eliza gave to her son. Um, during the visit, she gifted him um, a set of sleigh bells and the sleigh bells um, are, are still survive and they're actually part of the collection at the Wisconsin Historical Society. We have um, two identical matching sleigh bells that were gifted to um, William um, from Eliza in 1837. Um, and, you know, so what she knew about the weather, what she would have known about the territory was limited, but um, she would have realized that this kind of, of sleigh bell would have been, would have been useful um, for his time in, in Wisconsin. So I, I said at the beginning that we were going to talk a little bit about this photograph. And I know that um, there have been a couple of people that have commented on Facebook already that the photograph that we used for the promotion of this talk isn't William Hamilton, that it's Philip Hamilton. Um, and actually, that is the central question that the research that I worked on back in 2012 tried to answer is, is that William Hamilton or is it Philip Hamilton? Um, if you Google uh, children of Alexander Hamilton, um, the thing that the, the, this is a screenshot that I took yesterday and, and what comes up in that screenshot is um, all the pictures of all of the children. And um, you can see that the same picture is used for Philip that is also used for William. Um, the picture of Philip is a reproduction from the Granger collection in New York City and the picture of William is um, from uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, and so a lot of people have asked us how we came to identify this portrait as William. Um, and this stems back to the research that I did in 2012 with this researcher who was doing a biography of William. Um, she actually asked the exact same question. She said, what leads the Wisconsin Historical Society to identify this image as William? Um, and so, um, my job as an archivist was to try and find an answer to that, you know, thinking about the provenance of our collections and where they come from and how we know um, historical information is what we say it is. Um, so this, this image was used in a book that was published in 1930, and that is the first time that it's used in a book to, um, and is attributed to be William. And um, in that book, um, it gives the photo credit of the Wisconsin Historical Society as having provided the image. Um, and so I started looking into the image a little bit more. And what I found is that um, in the 1880s, the director of the Wisconsin Historical Society was in the practice of writing to prominent figures around the country, asking them to provide information on our founding fathers and if they had any collection material, if they had letters, if they had photographs, if they had diaries or journals, things like that, asking them to donate them to the Wisconsin Historical Society so that they could be preserved for documenting North American history. And it turns out that because William had spent time in Wisconsin and was such a well-known figure, they wanted to, to document William's time here. So our director sent a letter to Philip Hamilton, um, Philip Hamilton the Younger, so William's youngest brother, asking some biographical questions and asking if he had any materials related to the family. And this is one page of the letter's response. And in that, in the center paragraph, which I realize is probably impossible for most of you to read, um, what Philip says is that he's happy to be able to provide an image of his brother 
um, that was taken, it's a photograph that was taken of an ivory miniature of William. And so he had basically a reproduction of this painting made um, and preserved as a photograph. Um, and then he sent the Wisconsin Historical Society this photograph. And so this letter is sort of the primary piece of evidence that we use to date or to say that the photo is, is William, is this letter from his youngest brother, Philip. Um, but when we were doing the research on the photo, um, we wanted to try to be as sure as possible that we believed that this was William or why we believed it was William, why we attributed it to William. So we also sent the image to a clothing conservator, a clothing curator, a textiles curator on our staff. Um, we didn't give her any information about who the image was of. Um, we didn't give her any sort of dates or windows to work within. And we just asked her to date the photograph based on the information that was provided to her through, through the picture. Um, and she came back to us and she said that um, if the image had been made um, before 1800, that the image would have likely looked something closer to this, um, that the subject would likely have either had his hair powdered or would be wearing a wig. Um, the collar and the width of his lapels would have been different and the style of his cravat would have also have been different. Um, and because um, of the way that this image was styled because of his hairstyle and his lapels and his cravat and collar, um, she thought that this looked to be a little bit closer to a slightly later period in time and that she would have dated the image more closely to 1815 to 1825. Um, and so if we think back all the way to the lifespan of the Hamilton children, by 1815, um, the elder Philip would have already passed away. Um, but 1815 to 1825 does correspond pretty nicely with the time period in which William would have been coming of age. It corresponds with the time that he would have been leaving home to attend West Point. Um, and so this would have likely been a time when the, the family would have potentially had um, a, a, a miniature or a painting done of, of William. Um, and so um, between the letter and some of this um, textiles information, um, we felt more confident that the picture was depicting William. Um, and so that is part of the reason why, why we continue on our website. And when people ask us who this is a picture of, um, we say that it is William. Um, we also um, contacted the, the Grange um, to see um, if they had any evidence otherwise to suggest that the image isn't William. Um, and they did not have a lot of supporting evidence back in 2012. Um, they told us that they had received the image from the Granger collection um, in New York and that the um, Granger identifies it as Philip. Um, and that part of the reason why it's identified as Philip is because it's known that Philip and Alexander had a very strong likeness to each other, um, a very striking resemblance. And that's part of the reason why it's always been assumed that that image is of Philip Hamilton. Um, the conclusion that we sort of came to at the end of our research was that there's no real way to know absolutely for certain which is which, um, that the only real way to know for certain would be if we were able to find the original portrait. Um, and so um, that is it's a little bit inconclusive, but it's kind of an interesting mystery to try and figure out. Um, and the end of the story is that um, in 1849, um, William decided that he was going to try and uh, get rich with the gold rush. And he goes to California um, to become a miner. Um, and um, this coincides with a time where his lead mine had stopped being as profitable. Um, he uh, had hit water. And in order to make the lead mine more profitable, he would have needed to pump a lot of water out of his mine. Um, so he goes west in 1849. Um, with the gold rush 
Um, unfortunately, when he gets to Sacramento, he, um, he gets cholera and he dies in August of 1850 at the age of uh, 53. Um, so he is buried in Sacramento, California. Um, he has had actually multiple gravestones over his grave. Um, his current gravestone um, also includes a bust of his father and that's also included on this slide here. Um, so I, I, I sort of hope you guys enjoyed uh, this story. Um, it's really interesting how the historical documentation sort of coincides to sort of give us a peek into what territorial Wisconsin was like. Um, it also provides a little bit of context for the work that historical archivists and librarians do every day to assist researchers. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi everyone, Fran Paleo Moyer here, Badger Talks producer Simone. Thanks for your super detective work there and trying to crack the case of the picture and um, for all of the interesting information here about William today. And we have some great comments in the chat. Um, April Walker saying thanks for clearing that up about the picture. Um, Janet Murphy just posted a question. Oh, she says a comment. A bust of his father is on his gravestone. How strange. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, the the bust of his father is um, is on there. It, it wasn't added until much later. So when he passes away from cholera, um, there was a cholera ec epide epidemic in um, Sacramento at the time. And so he actually first is buried in a mass grave with a lot of other people who died of cholera. Um, when word reaches Wisconsin, he has a number of friends um, who don't think that's appropriate for him to be buried in this mass grave. So they do some fundraising and they get him re-interred with a gravestone that talks about his own political career. Um, and then a number of years later, um, the family actually paid for the headstone um, that includes um, his life and death dates and, and the bust of his father. Um, I think that, you know, what we know about Eliza's life is that she spent a very long time um, defending the legacy of her husband and making sure that he would be remembered. And I think that that's something that just carried through into the Hamilton family. Um, so I also think that it's a little odd, but it's also not surprising knowing what we know about Hamilton. It's really so interesting. Yeah. And what a that was, boy. Um, Cheryl SG comments, when Aaron Burr remarried in his later years, his wife filed for divorce very soon after the marriage. One of Hamilton's sons defended her in the divorce and did it for free. Were you aware of that? Um, I wasn't aware of it, but um, all of the, all of the boys, all of Hamilton's sons practice law. Um, so mm -hmm. William is, you know, that's one of the reasons why William is a little bit of the odd person out is because he doesn't defend law. Um, so, or he doesn't really take up the law significantly in his career. Um, but that is sort of interesting that, you know, they're, they're, those families are all still so interconnected and, and you know, we just have to think about the population of our country was so much smaller at that time. So who people interacted with and, and moved with would, would have been a much smaller circle. So Jane Mayer has posted several times in the comment, but she was wondering whether other founding fathers had so many children. Do you know, uh, just sort of roughly, when we look at all of our founding fathers, were many of them, you know, big families? That's interesting. I'm I'm not a scholar of the founding fathers, so I don't know in particular. I you know I don't think that you know Washington and Jefferson left behind large families. I know John Adams had um, a number of children, but um, but you know just the way that that um, that disease and and things moved through the country in that early time period. Um, I think that you know. And, and you know mortality rates among women and childbirth that would have made all of those variables would have um, dramatically affected how large and small a family was at that time. 
Thank you. Uh, a couple of people are questioning about the, the grave and the bust of Alexander on William's grave. And they're wondering if in fact, William is the one who's buried there. Or is it possible that they got maybe the wrong body uh, from the mass grave? Yeah, so, um, you know, this, this sort of goes to what evidence is there and, and what documentation we have. So we have to just rely on the small snippets of documentation that we have. Um, I know that the, the gentleman who helped um, reinter him in the 1850s um, that did the fundraising in Wisconsin, it was something that they were very concerned about. And there is a little bit of documentation that they felt assured that they had found the right person, the right body to reinter. Um, I don't know that, I, I am sure in fact that, you know, no one's ever done any sort of DNA analysis of it. Um, and it, it's possible um, that it's not the right body, but um, I, I don't, I don't know how we would, I don't know how we would prove that or if anyone would really want to prove that at this point. It's just sort of part of the, the mystery of history. It is, and it's fun to think about. So <laughs> a couple of other comments. Uh, somebody must have looked this up. John Adams had four children, Jefferson, one daughter, Washington, one surviving stepson. Mm -hmm. Jefferson had several with Sally Hemings. Yeah. Uh, Washington and Martha never had children together, but she had children from a previous marriage that he raised as his own. And then uh, Jane comments, Jefferson, Jefferson had several others out of wedlock, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, fascinating. Simone, thanks so much for bringing this to our attention. Are there any books that you would recommend that anybody who's interested, you know, about William Hamilton or the children should read? Um, there are, um, there's not, I mean, so there's a biography that was written of William in 1930. There has not been a lot of significant research that's been done on him biographically. Um, you know, the books that I would recommend that would give you a better sense of what his life was like is in Wisconsin would be um, a couple, there's, there's a few books that are out there related to the history of Wisconsin during sort of the fur trade in territorial Wisconsin. Um, and um, those might be interesting to sort of get an idea of, you know, how small the population was. I always thought it was, I thought it was shocking that, you know, there was um, only 30,000 people in the state around 1840. And then by 1850 in the census, there's been, a, um, a, there's over 300,000. So um, the growth potential in just that 10 years is just staggering. So um, that time period is really interesting and could give you a good sense of, of what the, the period was like. Well, fantastic. Simone Munson, thanks so much for joining us today and uh, sharing what you know with the people of Wisconsin. We really appreciate it. Everyone be sure to tune in next Tuesday, November 24th. And we're gonna be talking to uh, world-renowned musician, Mark Hetzler, who happens to be the professor of trombone at UW-Madison. And he's gonna be talking about the benefits of music that can change your life. And he'll be talking about his own stories and how music has impacted him as a professional musician, but just also uh, on a personal level for him. He will also be uh, sharing musical examples, both recorded and live. So tune in next Tuesday at noon. As always, visit badgertalks.wist.edu for upcoming talks, and you can also sign up for our email list there. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.